Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us here today. Um, I'm Mark Crowther, I'm the chair of the department, uh, and uh, we're a special set of uh, teaching rounds today uh, from Tanya Petrovic. Tanya has worked with the department now for a number of years and came to me a couple months ago to say that she was really intrigued by some of the functionality, some, yeah. functionality in uh, Office 365. Uh, and uh, we thought it'd be great to have her do a little session on some of the functionality that she's found. And I'm going to do a brief intro uh, of Office 365 and then I'll turn it over to Tanya and then we'll have time for question and answers at the end. So Office 365 is a Microsoft product uh, which is provided to all members of the McMaster community, both uh, faculty, staff and uh, students. Uh, the product would cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars if you bought it at Best Buy, and it's essentially free um, if you're an employee of the university. It has a vast amount of functionality, probably most importantly for the average user, is that it gives you free copies of the entire Office 365 suite, um, multiple copies that you can install on computers that you designate uh, at home. They don't have to be your one at work. You can also log in and install them at home, particularly now when we're all working at home. Uh, the, obviously, the most commonly used Microsoft products are uh, Office, Word, Excel, uh, uh, sorry, Word, Excel, um, maybe some of the, uh, um, the database stuff and, and Outlook. Uh, but there's all kinds of other stuff built into Office 365, uh, some of which is a real time saver. Uh, and I see many of our administrative assistants are on line and I think Tanya is going to help to you to understand some of the stuff that might be of use to you but also more broadly for faculty that join us later on in the year we're going to have an, uh, a whole series of educational webinars put on by uh, University Central Computer Services uh, talking about some of the uh, Office 365 uh, materials and doing some training in it as well because uh, I really would like to have broad uptake of this. One of the reasons is that uh, when we use Gmail or uh, SaneBox or uh, Dropbox or Box to store stuff, that's being stored in uh, a, a servers in unknown locations and may actually violate some of our privacy rec uh, requirements. Whereas if you use Office 365 at McMaster, um, it meets all of the requirements for privacy insofar as it's stored on encrypted servers in Montreal. So it's not actually leaving Canada, uh, unlike data for things like Google. Uh, and in addition, uh, the hospitals, with respect to email, have uh, agreed that McMaster email uh, and the two hospital emails are all sufficiently secure uh, to allow us to communicate about patient care uh, in, in within that environment. So with that, um, Tanya has been at McMaster uh, for uh, almost six years, started her career in finance and transitioned to payroll. Uh, and then she's moved on with an interest in HR, so completed her human resources management diploma at McMaster and obtained her CHRP designation. Uh, she's um, been a kind of a leader in the department and adopting new technologies and uh, also uh, has a strong interest in exploring uh, some of the, uh, the value of Office 365. So I will turn it over to Sonia and turn my microphone and camera off and we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. If you want to ask a question at any point during the thing, you are muted. Uh, so just ask it in the question and answer box. I will be monitoring that. It's at the bottom of the screen. You can just click on it and type in it. And I'll, uh, if there's a question that needs to be answered on the fly, I'll interrupt Tanya and I'll also ask Tanya if she could keep that box open so she can watch for questions and answers as well. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks so much, Mark, for that lovely intro. Uh, good morning, everybody. Hope everybody's got uh, their coffee in hand and is ready to go. Uh, so as Mark said, I really enjoy uh, technology just because I find it can save us so much time on things. And um, a lot of it, I just honestly tend up end up playing around with or um, you know looking for the answers on Google. I'm an avid Googler, except when it comes to my medical symptoms. I've learned uh, to not Google those anymore because uh, the results tend to be a little interesting. So um, definitely a lot of these things uh, I will let you know I am self-taught, so I'm not a Microsoft expert or anything like that. But uh, I do find if you just play around with it, test it out, um, usually it's a good way to kind of get to know the program. So I'm going to just go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, there we go. So basically, I guess the first question is, OK, you know, we're talking about this Office 365. How do I even get to Office 365? And there's a couple of ways. Uh, there, there's a direct route, or you can go through McMaster's portal. If you just open up uh, any browser window and in your address bar, type in office.com, 
it should take you to a screen that looks like this. Um, and of course, I've already logged multiple, logged in multiple times, so it's kind of recognizing me, but you'll be able to log in through there. The other way as well, if you just um, look up, if you go to Google and just type in McMaster Office 365, the very first result you get will take you to McMaster's 365 page, which has a wealth of information on there as well, but it will also take you to the portal in here where you can log in as well. So either or, whatever you find easiest, um, will get you there. And, and some people wanna bookmark this page and they can do that and then return to it later. So I'm just gonna go in through my regular way here, say sign in, and it's already remembering my password, so that's great. And I'm going to say no, just because I use other email addresses. So I toggle between them. So then it basically takes me to my um, uh, main page. So on the side here, you're going to see a whole bunch of apps, uh, Word, Excel, Outlook, things like that. Um, and then it gives you a whole bunch of documents um, that you've recently worked with, because anything that's um, emailed back and forth in our uh, uh, on our server at McMaster, it's kind of kept on the drive. So. The one app that we're going to be exploring today is going to be uh, Microsoft Forms. So that's the one that has uh, basically the F and it's, if you hover over, it says Forms. So if you click on Forms, it's gonna take you again to your dashboard. Uh, you can see that I've done a whole bunch of different surveys. Um, and um, in here, it's gonna give you an option to do a new survey or a new quiz. So what is Forms good for? So um, obviously, if you're an instructor, you can uh, do quizzes to test your students' knowledge. That's one piece of it. But it's also very good to collect data. So whether that is, you know, you want to put out a survey, um, it could be something as simple as, you know, you just want to collect phone numbers or people's preferences on, let's just say, working from home or something like that, just because we're in COVID, uh, to actually, you know, using it a kind of as an exit data point. So for example, for myself, I deal with postdoc fellows. So when postdoc fellows finish their appointment, I need to collect uh, some data from them to be able to issue their certificates at the end of the year. So I use it as a, I've created a form for myself where I basically just ask them a few simple questions. And when I know that a postdoc will be ending their appointment, I send them the link, they fill it out, and it basically pops into a um, Excel spreadsheet for me. And then I can access the data that way. So basically the main use for forms is to collect data and it's, um, pretty easy to use because everything is kind of uh, you just read the screen and, and click. So once you're on in um, Office 365 and you're on the form screen, up here you're going to ch uh, choose the drop down and instead of new quiz, you're going to choose new form. And it's going to take you to a screen where you can start building your survey now. Uh, lots of different options here. So basically, let's just say you want to do a survey to collect. Um, contact information. So you can just say the title of this survey is contact info uh, survey. And then you can enter a brief description. You know, this survey is being conducted to collect employee contact information, whatever it may be that you would like to do. You can even add a image here. So if you want to add, you know, the Department of Medicine logo or another different uh, picture, you can do that just by clicking the little picture button and um, you can search one off the internet or you can upload one from your own personal files. Okay, so that basically creates your uh, question, your uh, title and your description. And then from there, you basically start adding questions. So if I click on add new, it's going to give me some options. What kind of questions do I want to uh, add? Do I want it to be a choice, a text question, a rating, a date? Uh, a Likert, uh, do I want them to upload a file, uh, a promoter score, whatever it may be. So let's just say you want to add a choice question. So let's just say you pick choice and then it's gonna say, okay, what is your question? And one of the questions might be, um, which site are you located at? And then in your options here, you can type in the different options. So let's say it's MUMC, uh, HGH, another option for St. Joe's, uh, Jurevinsky, and so on. So that gives you your options. You can keep going and add um, as many as you need. You can also choose to add the other option. So if you do that, you're gonna say that people can choose other and then they'll be able to actually type their answer into the box. Let's say you made a mistake and um, you know there's no other or there's no Jurevinsky, whatever it may be. 
you can just use the little delete sign. Once you click on the answer, there's a little delete trash can that comes up. If you just click on that, it will get rid of that option for you. And so you can choose as many as you want, um, or again, the other option, if um, you know there's something you might not be thinking of, people can enter their own. You can also move, move these around if you want. So you'll notice when I click on one, there's the trash can on the right, and then these little ellipses, there's six of them will come up to the left. If you click on that, you can actually drag it up or down. So if you want to, for whatever reason, change the order of them, you can do that as well uh, with that step there. Um, a couple of other options that the questions will have. Um, main one here is the required or not. So whenever you send a survey, you can either um, ensure that the question is required. So if you toggle that on, then whoever's taking the survey has to answer this question. If they don't answer this question, they'll get a red error message saying, uh, you missed answering a question, please go back and answer question one. And the whole question will kind of um, uh, light up red so they know that that's the one they're missing. So you can either make it required or not required. You can also for uh, the choice question, select if you want multiple answers or not. So if you toggle that on, you'll be able to see that they become check boxes and someone can actually select uh, multiple questions. Let's say somebody works at multiple sites, then they'd be able to select the multiple options here. And then the other feature you'll see um, when you're answering questions is a little ellipses uh, at the bottom right. So here's where you can uh, choose a couple of other options. One could be a subtitle. And if you click on that, you'll see it just adds another line. So, um, you know, let's just say you wanted to say, which site are you located at? The subtitle could be, you know, choose all that apply, for example. That could be a subtitle. Or you can even just put that choose all that apply up in the question and then you would not need the subtitle. So if I want to get rid of the subtitle, I'll just go back to the ellipses and uncheck subtitle and it'll make it go away. Another piece is branching. I'll talk about that just in a little bit later, but um, that's another option. So every time you're in a question, basically you can kind of play around with it, see, okay, what are my options? What can I do with this question? Um, you know, subtitle, I can add branching. You can shuffle the options as well. What that will do is um, when people see the survey, the options will be shuffled. Um, for the type of data that I'm usually collecting, I find I don't really need to shuffle the questions. I find that more useful if I was maybe cre creating a quiz and you know the students um, can't share answers if I shuffle the questions and, and the answers so they can't share that data. But for a survey, generally, if you're designing a survey, generally you have it pretty planned out and you really don't want to change the order of things, you kind of want to keep it the same. So, it is another option. I just find that I don't um, think it's really necessary to use in a survey, more in a quiz type situation. So that's a, a choice question. Let's just say we're gonna add another question. So to add another question, I can just say add new. And let's just say I thought to myself, oh, you know what? Maybe I should have asked them for their name first instead of jumping right in and asking for their location. So I'll actually be able to move this question up on top. So I'll show that in a second. So let's just say I want to ask for their name. So what kind of question am I gonna ask? It's gonna be a text question. So question two, I'm, I'll just say, please enter your full name and they'll be able to enter that in the box here. Um, for a name, usually it's sufficient to leave as is. If you wanted something where they can type in, you know, you know, three to four sentences, you can choose long answer and then people can type in more than just your name. This, this I generally tend to use if I'm asking for like feedback or comments then I'll toggle that on. Uh, but if it's just a name, then generally a short text should suffice. And again, I can choose if it's required or not. And then you'll see here now that I can actually move this question up or down. So let's just say again, I just remembered I should ask for their name first. If I just click on the little arrow here, it will actually place that question into the first spot. And now my survey flows and makes a lot more sense. Again, you have your little ellipses here where you can choose um, what you want to do with it. There are some restrictions you can set. Um, if you, for whatever reason, need to collect a number and uh, you need to specify, you know, that number needs to be greater than 50, whatever it may be, you can do that here. So um, the restrictions really only apply to numbers and you can say, you know, greater than, equal to, let's say you want, um, you know, the number has to be greater than 50 for whatever reason, you just type that in and then the person um, will get an error message if they were to enter 49 or, or, or anything lower than 50, basically. So that's uh, that. I'm going to go back and just turn the restrictions on because I don't need that. So there's that. So that's two types of questions. Other questions you'll see, there could be a rating question, uh, a date question. So let's just go with date, for example. And let's just say for whatever reason, I'm going to ask them, you know, 
you know, what, what is your start date? This employment start date. And basically what they'll get then is basically a box where um, they'll actually be able to click on the little calendar and um, a little calendar thing will pop up where they can select a date. Again, options here, you can either make it required or not, or you can add branching or subtitle. So not too many options with these ones, but just remember that you, generally there is something that you can do with it if you click on the little ellipses. Another good thing that I use with this as I'm building it as well is uh, I wanna see what it's gonna look like on the user's end. So pretty easy. If you click on the preview button just up top here, it will actually show you what it's going to look like on their end. So you can see that they'll be able to put in their name, for example. Um, you can see that they'll be able to put in their start date. So I'm just gonna pick today's date. And you'll be able to see that right now they can select multiple sites. They can e even use other and type in uh, something else, for example, in there. So you can kind of see what it looks like on their end, which is nice. I always use that because I'm always conscious of, you know, what does it look like for the user who's actually gonna be filling this out. And it actually gives you two views. So what is it gonna look like if they access this on their computer? And what is it going to look like if they access this um, on their uh, mobile phone? So it's very similar actually on the mobile, but you can kind of see the two little views, which is very nice. I like having that little feature there. So I'm just gonna go back to take me back to my survey and then I can continue building. Another question that you may need to use would be the Likert scale. And basically this is the one where, you know, you can rate it is satisfied highly dissatisfied whatever the option may be so um let's just say um i don't know how satisfied are you with the speaker today something simple and then i could basically choose it's going to give you some options that you can actually already um fill in so i can just hit very satisfied here let's say option two i want it to be um Somewhat dissatisfied, option three, neither, option four, somewhat, option five, very. So it's very intuitive. It's going to give you options based on what it thinks you're asking, which is nice and saves a lot of time. Uh, if it hadn't given me that, I would have had to go in and actually type in my own options here. So that's very nice and easy. And then let's just say I'm not gonna ask you, you know, how satisfied were you with, um, you know, the quality of uh, sound, uh, how, you know, and the, maybe the quality of the material, whatever the, the options may be here. And then the user will, will be able to rate it um, based on their choices there as well. So remember, anytime you have a question, uh, you can make it required or not, and you can choose if there's an option or not. This one here, you can add a subtitle or you can add branching to it. So lots of different types of questions that you can play around with, um, depending on your needs. Um, you know, again, I'm sure there's people here that can think of a multitude of uses for this, you know, whether it's something to do with the residents, maybe, maybe you need to collect data from the residents when you're doing scheduling, and this could simplify your life, or for whatever other reasons uh, it may be, um, I've used it to collect, uh, you know, contact information or um, conduct a survey, uh, like I said, with my postdocs or exit data, so many different uses for it. A little bit more customization that you can do is also change the theme. If you go up here to the top, right beside the preview button, you can choose a theme. Um, it's gonna give you, you know, some ideas and options that you can choose. Uh, you just basically click on it and it'll change the screen to what you want it to be. Uh, this one looks like maybe it's like a retail survey one. Um, this one could be for a team. If you just want a plain color, you can choose a plain color here as well. Lots of different options that you can toggle through and you can even add your own picture if you wanted to create your own theme. I, I do believe McMaster in general does use this and I think they have a preset with the maroon colors. So I think they have that one, which I think this is probably the closest one to it, but uh, you can change and play around with it and make it more visually appealing uh, there as well. Um, so let me go back and talk about the branching. So the branching would be if you basically want this to automatically skip to another question. So let's say, for example, um, let's say, for example, I decided to do this question here and said, which site are you located at? And uh, let's just say I, I want to add another question where if they choose other, I want them to, to basically explain why they're choosing other. Let's just, for example, do that. So I'm going to say add a new question. And it's going to be text and I'm going to say if you chose other 
please specify or, or something like that, just for to make make it quick. So what I can say here now is okay. So I'm gonna go back to question three, and I'm gonna say choose a little ellipses and choose the branching. So when I hit add branching, it's going to um, basically oops sorry ask me what do I want to do. Sorry. So the branching actually sorry it only works if you choose the um, the uh, uh, not multiple selection. So I'm just going to go back and go back here and change that real quick. So instead of allowing multiple answers, I'm only going to allow one answer. So now when I do that, it should let me add the branching. Perfect. So that's what I was looking for. OK, so now you can see if somebody chooses the HGH, it's going to go to number four. If someone chooses St. Joe's, it's also going to go to question four. If someone chooses Momsi, going to go to question four. So what you can say is, okay, if someone chooses HGH, they really don't need to answer question four. So I want them to right away skip to question five. They don't even need to uh, choose question four because they're not, they've not chosen other. So what you do in here, you can basically just say, go to question um, five. And for all of those choices that are not other, you can select that. And for the other one, you're going to choose next because it's going to go to question four. So if I preview this, I will show you what it looks like. Okay, so if I go back and I go to preview. So if I pick HGH, you can see it doesn't go to the other question. If I pick other and start typing something in, so it's going to go to the other question. So that's basically how you can use branching to fine tune the survey and uh, choose what questions people will go to based on their choices on another question. And what this does really, it'll save the user time um, because you know there, it's different when you get 10 questions versus you know 15 questions. And if someone only has to answer four or five, they're probably going to be more likely to take your survey than if they have to answer 20 questions. So branching is a very useful tool um, if you want to uh, kind of fine tune it and say again, you know, if, if if you answered A, then you don't need to answer B and so forth. So that's a quick demo on the branching. So I'm going to go back here again. And once you're ready to send your survey, you basically are just going to go up in here and to share. There is another ellipsis here. And if you're wondering what that is, there's more settings you can choose. Uh, you can choose to print the form if you want. I mean, it kind of defeats the purpose of it being digital. But if for some reason, you know, you had to print it uh, and give it to somebody as a paper form, you can do that in the settings here. If you click on settings, you can also choose a couple more things. So. One thing to note is that if you want anyone to respond, that's fine, which means that when they get the survey, they're not going to have to log into anything. Anybody can respond. It does not have to be a McMaster person. The only thing is there's a question you can add here where you can ask somebody to upload a file. So let's say you need someone to upload a document with the survey. You can do that. However, if you choose to do that, then you will not be able to send the survey to just anyone. And the reason they've done that is basically a security feature because they don't know where documents and attachments are originating from. So if you would like a file upload to be included uh, from whoever's entering the survey responded essentially, you will only be able to, to choose only people in my organization can respond. And if I was actually to go in and add a question in here about the file upload, you won't even be able, like this will be grayed out and you will not be able to choose that anyone can respond. So. Um, if you do a file upload, it's only people in your organization. And what actually happens is they get a survey link and when they click on that link, they'll have to log in with their Mac ID and password. They're basically logging into 365 at that point and they'll be able to take the survey from then. Versus if you choose that anyone can respond, they don't have to log in. They can just go into the link and fill out the survey. So just a note difference there. If you do try to do a file upload, you won't be able to do that. So you can choose, again, who can respond here. Uh, and you can also choose whether you want one response per person or you would like to allow multiple responses from people. And you can also narrow it down. I've never had to do this, but if you want to actually say, you know, only specific people can respond, let's say you only want to send it to six people and only those six people can respond, then um, you can do that as well here. But generally, um, only the people you send the link to are going to be able to respond anyway. So I don't think you would really need to make it that specific, but if you do that option is there as well. And then you can also choose, you know, when do you want to start it? When do you want to end it? For example, if you choose to only collect responses for a week, you can actually put an end date in and say, you know, uh, they have to respond by this date and time. 
Um, same with the start date. Let's say you know you want to start taking responses next Monday. You can uh, put in a start date of when you want that to happen. Um, you can also um, customize the thank you message. So when they respond to this, they're going to basically get something that says, you know, thank you for submitting your response. You can customize that, and uh, you know, right now it says your response was submitted. You know, you can say something like, thank you for taking the time to submit the survey, et cetera, et cetera. So you can also customize your thank you message. And then the set last piece of the settings here is your uh, response receipts. So um, basically what this one will do is get email notification of each response. So if you click that, then every time someone answers the survey, you're gonna get an email in your inbox to say, um, you know, somebody has filled out the survey. Did you wanna go and take a look at it? And then this one here would be if you want to allow the receipt of responses after submission. So um, once it's been submitted, do you want to get receipt of responses or not? Basically check that box there. So those are your settings options there. You can choose whatever you like. So let's just say for this one, I'm going to say anyone can respond. I'm going to accept responses. I don't care about a start and end date. I've customized my message. I'm good to go. So I can just click on the ellipses to get out of there and it's gonna take me back to my normal screen. And then now I'm ready to share the survey. I just click on share and I can share it in a few different ways. I can either just take this link, copy it, and then paste it into an email message and send it out that way. I could choose to um, use the uh, QR code. Uh, I haven't used this one yet, but you can use that as well. So people just scan that with their phone and they'll be able to access the survey that way. You could uh, copy the code and paste it into a web page, or you could um, basically uh, send it as an email right away, and you can see it opens up uh, my Outlook and asks me to send a message. So, a few different ways that you can share. I'm going to say no here. You can also uh, share it as a template, so you can send this to somebody else. If they, let's say, you already did a survey and you're like, oh, you know, maybe you would find this useful on your site. You can share that and somebody can uh, as a template and somebody can take that and customize it to their own needs if they want or you can collaborate so you could also get a link to view and edit so basically uh, this link here if you copied it and gave it to somebody they'll be able to go in and um, collaborate with you and kind of edit the survey and, and go from there so that's basically how you would share the survey once you've shared it you're going to start getting responses when you go back in uh, you just go to the responses tab and it's going to give you responses here. So, of course, nobody's taken my survey because I haven't sent it out, but you'll actually be able to see um, the responses and you can look through each one individually or you can open them in Excel. So if you click on open in Excel, once it's there, it's going to actually upload all of your responses into Excel. And as we all know, the power of Excel, you can then use that to analyze the data. And um, you'll actually also be able to, there's going to be a thing here that says uh, like, like a link you can share with others. So it's basically going to give them the link to the Excel so they can they can see the data as well. So it's very collaborative, uh, works really well. Um, do keep in mind that whoever creates the survey, it kind of is housed and sits in their Office 365 account. So I logged into Office with my account. So the survey kind of sits with my email. Um, you could do it differently. Let's say you wanted to have a central mailbox. Um, for example, something that I'm thinking of is you know when we deal with our interim hire requests we could have a central mailbox and we could create a survey and then um, i would just have to make sure that i'm creating that survey from that central mailbox email and then um, somebody could fill it out let's say you know i want to hire you know susie and at this rate and that rate submit the form and then it'll actually go centrally into that mailbox and can be sorted from there so Lots of different uses for forms. Um, you can kind of make it your own. Uh, if it's something you're interested in, uh, I would definitely encourage you to just go in and play around with it. Um, people tend to be afraid with technology. I promise you, you can't break it. Um, you know, even if you wanted to share a survey, share it with a colleague to test it out, it's no problem. You can easily delete a survey. It's not going to, you know, send it out to the whole department or anything like that. So. Uh, the best way that I, at least for me, the way I learn is go in and play around with it. So um, that's what I would suggest if you're interested in this. Um, this is kind of, I've kind of, kind of quickly gone over the basics. I mean, I could sp probably spend an hour building a survey with you, but just uh, to go over it and show you kind of what sort of, uh, forms can do and what you can use it for. And, and honestly, kind of how simple it is, because it's, you know, once you've kind of figured out what question you need and, and built out your survey, it's just a matter of entering it in here. So. That is uh, forms. I do see a couple of questions, Mark. Is there any questions specific to forms that I can answer right now? Or 
I, I'm kind of answering them in real time. Okay. Uh, do, do you want to just, if you send it to me right now, I'll fill it out really quickly and then you can just show the, the way that the data looks like. Sure. So what I'll do is share. I'm just going to go to email. So you kind of saw how quick that was. I just clicked on the email, typed in uh, Mark's email, and it went, went off to him. So very, very quick. And I've already got it. Yeah, so it's very, very quick. Now, this is a very, very rough survey, you know, nothing that I would normally send out, but just to show an example. Done. And you guys saw it as soon as Mark did it, responses, look at that, already came up. So I can already see that I have a response. Uh, it tells me it took 33 seconds to complete. And this active just refers to that the fact that the survey is active, it can still be filled out. But you can see here that I have um, a response and, and you'll be able to, there, like a, there'll be an arrow to toggle between the responses if you want. But for now, I just have the one so I can basically see, um, it uses the, I think it's called the BI, Microsoft BI, to actually kind of give you the dashboard look. So it'll give you like a pie, like if, if more people fill this out, there would be a pie graph showing exactly where people were located. So it's actually a really nice view analytically to look at, but basically you can look through each response separately, or if you go to open an Excel, um, it's going to basically just dump it into Excel for you, uh, which I'm opening now. And of course it's only gonna be one response, but if you have multiple, you can kind of see, um, you know, how you can analyze the data or collect the data that you need from there. So very, very intuitive. Um, Microsoft's done a really good job with forms. I really like it. If I could use it for everything, I probably would just because I find it such a quick and easy way to collect data. Um, instead of, you know, typical, here's an email, you fill out this email. It's just a quick link, they fill it out. And usually, you know, if you have 10 questions on a survey, it usually takes the person maybe two minutes at the most to complete. So very, very nice tool. Any, is there any other questions that I need to worry about? forms or no i don't think so i think we're okay. i'm answering them in real time so you can just maybe okay. move on to the next thing yep perfect okay so i'm just looking at the time too so that's forms so uh and feel free if you have any specific questions you can also feel free to reach out to me privately more than happy to help so next thing i wanted to quickly touch on is just before i go into outlook the linkedin learning so if you're wondering tanya you know where do you get your information from i did mention google i do get a lot of information from google but another really great resource that's actually free for all McMaster staff is LinkedIn Learning. And again, to look, get to LinkedIn Learning, you can go the direct route, you can search it on McMaster. If you're looking for it on the McMaster site, if you just type in McMaster LinkedIn Learning, um, you'll get a little link to the UTS piece, which is right here. And once you scroll down, you'll be able to get into LinkedIn Learning. So that's one way. Or you can just go directly into linkedin.com forward slash learning. Uh, oops, I think I went a little too far. LinkedIn.com learning should take me to the login page. There we go. So from here, um, you can sign in. You do not need to have a, a LinkedIn account to access LinkedIn Learning. They're two separate things. You can link your LinkedIn Learning with your LinkedIn, and what that will do is when you take courses, um, you can actually. Uh, showcase them on your LinkedIn profile, but you do not have to have a LinkedIn account to access LinkedIn Learning. So I'm going to sign in with my Mac ID and password. Maybe I should go the other way because this one, this one just uses everything. So I'm just going to go through the McMaster one because that one asked me for my LinkedIn password and you won't need that if you're just going in. Okay, so you shouldn't need your LinkedIn password. It asks me for mine just because I already have a LinkedIn account. So don't worry about that. It should just ask you for your Mac ID and password. Mine just does that because I'm already um, connected. So here's my LinkedIn dashboard, very straightforward. Um, once the first time you log into this, it's going to ask you to identify some skills that you would like to work on, whether that's, you know, Microsoft Office, um, diversity training, um, you know, empathy training, whatever that might be, you can type those in and then it's actually going to give you recommendations on courses. So um, here's topics for me. 
Uh, you know, a lot of them are Microsoft Office related because that's one of the things that I'm constantly trying to uh, evolve on. So you'll be able to uh, have some top picks based on the skills you enter, okay? Um, in here, you'll be able to set a goal. If you want to really push yourself, you can change your goal. You can do 15 minutes of training a week, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, whatever you want to do. You can set, set yourself a little goal. You don't have to set the goal. You can um, also not have a goal, but this is kind of a nice little thing. It'll kind of light up once you've uh, uh, completed your goal and say, congratulations, you did it. So to me, it's the little wins. So I go with having a goal there, but uh, you certainly don't have to. Um, and then you'll be able to basically just take the courses. Um, there's courses and there's learning paths. Um, and you can see here, like this one here is a course. So it's just a standalone course. Uh, it's three hours and 34 minutes long. Uh, that's because this one goes through all the different apps in 365, uh, but it gives you kind of um, how long it is. So you can just click on it to go in and take the course, or if you want to just, you know, let me just save it for now and I'll think about taking it later. You can just click on the little save and then it's going to be saved for you. So let's say you're going here and you're like, mm, I want to take something about Excel. If you just go up into the search box and type in Excel, and hit enter, it's going to come up with a whole bunch of different options that you can do. And it'll tell you whether it's a course or a learning path. So you'll see the very first one here is a learning path. It's called Master Microsoft Excel. And if I go into this learning path, what you'll see is, is that it's a learning path is made up of a whole bunch of courses. And when you've completed those, all of those courses, you get a little certificate saying you've completed the learning path. You also get a certificate after each course as well, but uh, it's kind of almost like a little, um, certificate of completion for completing a whole suite of things. So in this mastering Microsoft Excel, you can see that it's gonna have a whole bunch of different courses, you know, advanced formulas, formatting, a dashboard, charts, basically everything to do with Excel. So you can uh, complete each course as you go. And then once you've completed all the courses, you've completed the learning path, or um, if I go back, you notice that there was just courses, I can also just complete um, just standalone courses as well. If I go back to my learning dashboard here, you'll see the course that I saved is in my little saved section. You can also have collections. So let's say, you know, two things you want to learn about our uh, Microsoft Office and then um, diversity, belonging and inclusion. So DBI training. So I could actually create a collection. If I just click on create new collection, let's just say MS Office will be my one collection. And these are all my MS Office courses and hit create and there's one collection and let's say i want to do another about um you know dbi training there's my second collection hit create and then um, you'll actually be able to take those saved courses and put them in a collection so if i go back to my saved courses this one is related to office so if i click on more i can unsave it or if i click on add to collection i can add it to my collection so add to collection which one do i want to add it into my ms office one click add added and then when I go into my collection, I can see that course within that collection. So different ways you can organize it. And then, of course, you have your learning history where all the courses you've completed will be there. And then uh, your skills. This is the ones I was talking about when you first log in. It's going to ask you ones you're interested in. And of course, over time, you can change that. So let's just say I'm not interested in statistics anymore. I can just X that. And um, you know, let's say I'm interested in interpersonal skills. I can add that or I can search one here and add that as well. So very useful. Um, a lot of my office training I actually got from here. Anyone on here that's used to lynda.com, this is the new lynda.com. So we used to have access to that and now it's here. And for those that do have access, uh, that do have um, their um, connected to their LinkedIn, if you go to your LinkedIn profile, when you complete a course, you'll have the option of adding it there. So you can see here uh, at the bottom, here's the courses that I've taken and you don't have to add them all. It's an option. So I've taken like 41. I didn't put all 41 on my um, LinkedIn profile. I only chose to highlight certain ones. So very useful tool for LinkedIn, free for all staff. Um, you know, it, it, one of those things that to, to get something out of it, you have to use it. So you do have to make an effort to use it. Uh, something that I do, I honestly like, it, once I crawl into bed at the end of the night, open up my iPad, I spend 30 minutes. Um, most of the videos are very short. So each course is broken up into like little three to four, I think five at the most minute videos. So it's very easy to kind of stop somewhere and restart again the next day, a uh, little short burst of videos. So very useful tool for anybody that's interested in LinkedIn learning. Any questions before I move on to Outlook? 
Tanya, no questions, but I didn't even know this existed. That is a totally awesome set of things. I, it's been like cloaked or hidden from us. I would, I just logged in and I would encourage everybody to go log in because it's got all kinds of like really neat stuff. Yep, and it's some great topics. Like I know I chose to focus on the office suite, but there's a lot of even just learning, you know, how to be a good leader and, and things like that. A lot of uh, different courses you can do and just search whatever you want to search search for let's say it's diversity again type in the key term and it'll give you all kinds of you know conscious bias communicating it's i think it's got like thirteen thousand courses if i'm not mistaken that might be an old number but it has a lot of courses and they're constantly adding and updating on here as well so yeah it's a really great resource tanya one question that could you follow up with um is uh, uh you'll see there from kathy stewart uh if you look at the answered ones okay let's go to answer uh, do we have access to Office 365 when we retire? That's a good question. Um, I, I think as long as your Mac ID is active, then you should be able to still access Office 365 because that's what it's tied to. Um, I know it's available for staff, students, and, and staff, but I'm not 100% sure if it's available to retirees. I'd have to look into that, Kathy, but I'll take a look, and if I can find the answer, I'll definitely get back to you and let you know. I know, like I said, I know it's connected to your Mac ID. So I do believe I, you, can, you get to keep your email when you retire, but I could be wrong on that. So I think you should be able to, but again, don't quote me on that just yet. Yeah, so I'll find, we'll find out and get back to you. Yeah. Okay, so that's LinkedIn, the beauty of LinkedIn. So just gonna get out of those windows there. And a uh, couple of other things that I'm gonna talk about is basically your Outlook related. So uh we all use outlook for our emails but a lot of us also use it for meetings and uh you know if anything with covid and uh you know all the zoom meetings back and forth it's just a lot of meetings these days so i was kind of like okay how can i you know simplify things for myself a lot of the times i go in i set up a meeting but i have to go to my zoom account set up the meeting there paste it here go there is there a way i can do this in one click and lo and behold there is so Outlook is really great. And just also another note for anybody that has um, the office suite on their computer, make sure you have the 365. I do encounter a lot of people that still have the 2016 one and there's nothing wrong with that, but you'll get a lot more capability with the new one. So um, very easy to upgrade. If you just go into that portal, you can install all the new versions. So just one thing that if you do have the older versions on your computer, I highly encourage you to upgrade to the newer versions because they do have a lot more capability than the older ones. So the way that it's done now is basically a subscription. So whenever they get updated, you're going to get the newest version of the product versus when you just, you know, used to go to like Best Buy and buy the box. That's the box that you used to get. And that's the one you always had, but now it's more of a subscription based piece. So you're always, you're always getting the newest version. So let's just say I want to set up a meeting and um, you know, in your outlook, you're just going to go to your new items and you want to set up a new meeting. Pretty simple. So, Okay, so let's just say I want to meet with the two, the two busiest people that I know in my department, which is Mark and uh, Annette Rosati, our director of administration. So I just know that they're the two busiest people. And if I want to meet with them, I'm going to have to figure out a time that works for everybody. Okay, so let's just say uh, in my meeting, I'm going to meet with, uh, I'm going to choose Dr. Crether as a required, and I'm going to choose Annette as a required. Okay. So now I want to figure out when is the best time to meet with them. So right away, as soon as I do that, you're going to have this little room finder here, and it's going to give you some suggested times. This works off the Microsoft Scheduling Assistant. So uh, I'm actually always surprised at how many people don't know about the Scheduling Assistant, but it's something that's kind of always been there. It's not a special ad or anything. It's part of Microsoft uh, Outlook. So if I go up here and I choose Scheduling Assistant, what I'll be able to do now is actually see Mark and Annette's calendar. I won't be able to see all their details, but it's going to show me basically blocked off times where they're not available. So I can kind of toggle through here and figure out, you know, what, what might work for them. Or I can even just go up here, choose the auto pick, click on required people, and it's going to try to find a time that might work for everybody. So it, right now what it's doing is saying, you know, um, Friday, oh, sorry. Another thing is that this is only going to give me the work hours. So it's not going to give you anything after outside of 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. because that's what the default is. So if I keep clicking on auto pick, it should eventually find a time that works for everybody. So right now it's saying Tuesday, February 23rd between 10.30 and 11 is going to work for all three of us. 
So instead of me trying to, you know, email in that and say, hey, you know, when might you be available for a meeting? And then email Mark and say, when might you be available for a meeting? You can actually use the scheduling assistant to look at their calendars and say, okay, when might be a time that works for everybody? The only caveat here is that, you know, it depends on people having updated their calendar. So if there's people that don't ever put their meetings into their calendar for whatever reason, then of course you're not going to have the accurate data and you're kind of playing a guessing game. So that's kind of works on whatever has been stored in their calendar and what's on the 365 server. The other piece about the scheduling assistant is um, it's you can see things only for people that are on the same server. So basically McMaster people. If you're trying to schedule a meeting with HHS people or somebody outside of a, a completely different organization, you will not be able to see their calendars because we're not in the same exchange server. So that's the two things with the scheduling assistant. But for me, for myself, I generally tend to mostly have meetings with people within the organization. So this is something that I use, uh, you know, I schedule sometimes, you know, uh, meetings for the social meetings for our chair's office, and that's like 18 people. So instead of me trying to send out a survey and say, you know, when's everybody free, I can actually use a scheduling assistant to figure out a time that works for everybody. So once I picked a time, let's just say Tuesday between 1030 and 11 works. Oh, sorry, the other thing I wanted to mention with this, what's nice about this is uh, what I usually do is, you know, I, I can see when people are free. And when they're not free, so let's just say, for example, um, I can see here, you know, Annette's busy until 11.30. So maybe I don't want to schedule a meeting with her right at 11.30. Maybe I want to give her half an hour and I can see, well, she's free for the rest of the afternoon, for example. And I can choose to meet with her at 12 or 1 just to give that person also maybe a breather from back to back. So something that I also think about when I'm scheduling these meetings. But once I've picked a meeting time that works for everybody, if I just go back to, I can just send it from here if it's just a, a regular meeting um, with uh, no, no requirement to meet on Zoom or anything. But if I go back to my meeting assistant, um, I can either not go back to Zoom and, and use a meeting, but what I can do as well is I have this little add-in for Zoom meetings and I can just automatically add a Zoom meeting to it. So I'm just gonna put in a title, I'm just gonna call this testing. And if I go to add a Zoom meeting, it's gonna, think for a second here and boom, there's already a Zoom meeting added for me. And it's already in my Zoom account because everything is linked up for me. So first time you, you go into this, you're gonna have to sign in, but it's already in my Zoom meeting. So when I go to my Zoom account, I'll be able to just start this meeting. So basically in a couple of clicks, I was able to generate a very quick meeting uh, between two very busy people. So the scheduling assistant is great. Um, like I said, uh, the only caveat is you can't see people outside of the organization and you have to make sure that people um, have their calendar up to date, hopefully. So that's two things. Now, if you're wondering, okay, how the heck did you get to this uh, Zoom meeting uh, thing? Cause I don't have that in my Outlook. This is what's called an add-in. So Outlook has a whole bunch of different add-ins. Uh, some of them are, you have to pay for, some of them are free, but this Zoom meeting is a actually a free add-in that you can do. So I'm just gonna get out of this meeting here and I don't wanna save the changes. So when you're on your Outlook screen, you should have this little get add-ins box. It looks like a little, uh, little Lego box with a plus. So if I click on that, it's going to actually let me search for whatever add-in I wanna look, look at. So I happen to have the Zoom one. I have a quick poll by forms, find time. Uh, those are my main add-ins, but you'll actually be able to search for all kinds of, an, and honestly, when I started looking into this, I haven't looked at all of them, but there looks to be some really great ones. So I'll do some uh, research and see what might work for people as well. But this is how you can add it. And basically once you wanna uh, add one, let's just go to all, you just click on add and then you restart your office. So you close and open your Outlook and it's going to be uh, there for you. So very easy to add the add-in. So the one that I have for Zoom is called uh, Zoom for Outlook. So I don't know, I've, since I've got this, it's done wonders for me because I don't have to toggle back and forth. So I really love this one. So that's a simple how to use a scheduling assistant. So again, how did I get there in your meeting? Um, just up here, click on the scheduling assistant and you'll be able to use it to pick a meeting time uh, with people once you select it. So that's one of the ways you can schedule a meeting. Uh, and the second way is the find time add-in. So again, it's an add-in that you have to get, but uh, this one works very similar to Doodle Poll. So I'm assuming uh, most of you have seen a Doodle Poll. It's when you, basically go into Doodle Poll, you create um, times, and then everybody goes in and puts in their name and says, I'm available these times. So Find Time works very similar to that, but the nice thing about Find Time is that it's actually gonna do all the work for you. So 
let's just say um, I want to do a, um, you know, again, a meeting with, I'm just going to say, let's just say um, with the feather and Annette and my colleague Gail Laform, who is, you know, primarily uses her HHS email, just picking three people here. Once I have the find time add in, if I click on new meeting poll, it's going to also do kind of very similar to what the scheduling assistant does, and it's going to try to find times that we're all available. Again, you can choose, you know, is it a 30 minute or a 45 or a one hour meeting? And do you want it between work hours or not? So if it's red, that means that there is no time on these dates where all three of us are going to be available. Um, so I'm going to kind of try to find a time somewhere that all three of us might be available. Let's see if there's anything that comes up. Okay, so here we go, March 12th. Um, you can see here the availability. So eight or 2.30. It's going to show you the people. So I can see here the green, there's me, I'm free. There's Annette, she's free. There's Dr. Crother, he's free. And then there's Gail, unknown. Again, remember, even with fine time, you can't know what other people's, other organizations' um, calendars are. So one thing there. Um, and then let's just say I'm gonna pick March 12th. I'm gonna say, you know what? Either of those times work for me. So I'm gonna select them. And then I'm gonna go next. And here's where I can choose some settings. What do I want to do? Do I want to um, notify me about poll updates? So every time someone votes, it's going to let me know. Um, do I want this to be scheduled when, when the consensus is reached? So what it'll do is once everybody goes in and picks their preference, and basically it's just going to be in the email, they're going to get a thing they click on, very simple. Um, this meeting will automatically be booked and in everybody's calendars. So let's just say, you know, everybody agrees Friday, March 12th at eight. If everybody votes on that, it has green check marks, it's going to automatically send a meeting with that. The only thing I don't like about this and they're working on it is it doesn't automatically schedule a Zoom meeting for you, but it will automatically schedule a Teams meeting. It does Teams and Skype for business, but it doesn't have integration with um, Zoom just yet. But if you check off this team meeting, it's automatically going to schedule a team meeting, send it to everybody with the link and everything. So another very quick way to, um, to basic, basically schedule a meeting. Once you do this, uh, if you just click add to email, it's gonna say creating your poll and then it's going to just put it into uh, an email. And then if I was to send this, Mark and Annette and Gail would get something where they would just click and then they would select um, what they wanna vote for. If both times work, uh, find time selects the earliest times. If you have optional and required attendees, uh, once all of the required have made their choices, it's gonna schedule the meeting because the optional ones, either they come or they don't. So those are the, a couple of things to think about it. I'm, I think I'm running out of time, but um, is there any questions? Just time, just a, two points I'd make quickly. Um, one is that people may not know what micro, uh, Microsoft Teams is, but very briefly, it's exactly like Zoom. It has all the functionality of Zoom. So <laughs> if, if people are using Zoom, you can use Microsoft Teams. It has video conferencing capability. It's improving every 20 minutes because Microsoft realizes that Zoom is eating their lunch at the moment with respect to video calling. And then the second thing is if you go back, you may have noticed that uh, when you were looking for time in my schedule, first of all, that is my actual schedule. My schedule is up to date. So when people call and say, can you meet next Tuesday? I don't even have to look at my schedule. The answer is no. If they answer, can, can I meet next Tuesday a year from now? The answer is probably yes, but not necessarily. But beside my name, there was a little red dot. And do you want to explain what that means? The little red dot that was beside my name? Yep. Was that in the scheduling assistant or was that in find time or? You find time. Oh, okay. No, it's it's very simple. It just means I'm not available. So it's a fast way of looking to see if see that little red dot right there, that means that I'm not available right now. And, and so that, that is actually providing you with an instantaneous insight into uh, people's schedules, especially it's, it's useful when you're sending an email and you wonder why hasn't this person replied? Well, you know, I'm in meetings until six o'clock or seven o'clock tonight, and I may not get to it till after seven o'clock tonight. All right, we've got some questions here um, uh, in the thing. So I'll just read them to you, Tanya. We've got uh, six minutes left. How does Zoom for Outlook work if we need to reschedule the meeting? Do we just find it in the calendar to delete it, edit it? So can you, I guess, can effectively, can you recall a meeting that you've scheduled or can um, you delete it? You can delete it. So what it does actually, and I've tested this, is once you schedule it with the add-in, um, let's say you delete the meeting in your Outlook. Let's say that you don't need that meeting anymore. You actually do have to go back into your Zoom and delete it from there or just leave it there because nothing will happen with it. I did notice that piece that it doesn't, go back into your Zoom account and delete the meeting, the meeting stays there, but you can edit it. So you can edit it in, in your um, uh, actual Outlook calendar and it should, once you resend, it should 
reschedule the meeting for you. Hope Should update it. Yeah. 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 Uh, Alfonso Iorio, just double checking. If someone has a placeholder in their agenda set as available, that will be shown as available when using this tool, correct? Same as for tentative blocks. So if you've got things that are tentatively blocked, will this will they be blocked from this? I don't really actually know the answer to that. I actually don't know the answer either. I know with fine, I do know with fine time that when you do send out the poll and when you pick three or four different things, um, until the poll is finished, it does place um, placeholders in people's calendars, uh, or sorry, in the organizer's calendar at least for, um, let's say I picked three different times, those three times will be placed as holds. And then when the meeting actually gets scheduled, scheduled it does get rid of those holds, but I'm not 100% sure. I do believe that if you have it as a hold, but it's showing as available, that it should still show as available. I believe so. I think it only looks for busy times. Um, that's at least my understanding of it. So maybe Tony, you could, enough, could you but. check on that? And yep. Uh, yep. So we'll, we'll follow that up, Alfonso, thank you. And then Kathy Stewart asks, uh, do these features work for your scheduling for our supervisor? And, and the answer for that is yes. I guess if, if Gail were to be in my calendar uh, scheduling me, the email would look like it came from me um, as opposed to from Gail. But yes, you can absolutely do that. Uh, and uh, we've got from Melissa, just a great session uh, full of useful applications and tips. So um, other questions from people? I apologize right. if it was a bit rushed. I was trying to get a lot in there. But uh, if you have any questions, do feel free to reach out. I don't use Find Time as much as I use the scheduling assistant just because I don't meet with too many people outside of the organization. So I don't do the polls. But if there's anything I can help with, please feel free to reach out. I'm more than happy to do that. All right. Well, I'll we'll, uh, just like to take a moment to thank Tanya. That was um, incredibly useful. I, Annette and I were WhatsApping back and forth during the course of it. And I said, I've learned more in the last 40 minutes than in the last <laughs> month. So thanks very much. That was really incredible. Um, we, I did record it. And so uh, once I get a few minutes, we'll get it up on the Department of Medicine YouTube channel. If you want to find that, go to YouTube, YouTube type in Department of Medicine McMaster, and it will appear there. Uh, and uh, this was, I think, extraordinarily useful. And if everybody who's watching could tell everybody else about it, we'll probably reschedule it and just do exactly the same thing in maybe two or three weeks. Uh, and I'll get Tanya to actually host that one. And if you can all encourage others to attend, I think many people would find this to be an extraordinarily useful um, uh, session to go to. Uh, maybe also, Tanya, um, we could send out a poll. Can you take a screenshot of the people who are on right now? Uh, and maybe you could send out a survey to them just to um, get some feedback on the session and some any additional features they'd like to uh, uh, to uh, have access to. Sure, I can do that. Yep. Just give us one second so Tanya can do that. Okay, I got everybody. Good. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll end now, uh, and uh, we'll uh, talk to you at some point in the future. Thanks very much for attending. Hopefully, this was a useful uh, session. Okay, everybody have a great day.